If we could actually create more of these spaces, and even if they're temporary, even if they're pop-ups, which again is a much quicker, cheaper way to do it, that we could start to get people to see and experience the value of them, and that would in turn affect really long-term change. So welcome to the show, Aaron. And I know this was probably an odd request for you to, to come on, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory of why I reached out. So for our audience, they have heard AJ and I talk about third place, which is not your work and not your home. It's outside of both of those as a place of gathering community and meeting people. And there was an incredible book written about third place is called The Great Good Place by Ray Oldenburg. And I had read that book quite a long time ago. And in my youth, and I would probably include AJ in this as well, you know, when we were younger, we really enjoyed the dive bar scene. And, and, And certainly I've made several dive bars my third place as well. And it wasn't about the drinking. It was about the community and the camaraderie and just being social. And that was, that was the atmosphere that I enjoyed. And the thing that makes a great third place is that if there's parlor games there, they're set up in order for people to communicate and to meet each other and to socialize. And there is no rankings of tables and stages that separates you from everybody else. It's everybody is in there and everyone is equal. Everything's arranged for everyone to easily socialize and be seen and heard. And because everyone is equal, if I have an opinion that AJ or you don't like, you are free to tell me to shut up and I'm free to tell you to shut up. But the reality is for all of our lives, that's how we gathered, that's how we socialized, and that's how we built amazing communities. And you could also say that a lot of revolutions were forged from third places. Now, if revolutions were forged in third places and they don't make the city the money that they want them to make, well, Ray Oldenburg draws a line in the book about just why we're not seeing our cafes in France anymore, the pubs in Britain anymore, the dive bars in America and the cafes in Italy. Those have been drawn out due to not being able to make the money that they need to to survive. And our social lives are obviously not on the government's list of priorities. So it is up to us to do that. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So I would like to open it up and just share the floor with you of telling us a little bit about your work and how you, why you got into it and a bit of your backstory. Absolutely. We appreciate you having me here. And I am always excited about a chance to talk about third spaces, public spaces, and why they're so important. So yeah, I, I am the executive director of Culture House for an urban design nonprofit based in Boston and really focusing on what we like to refer to as social infrastructure. And that is another word for a third space, but we really you know, think about it as the places that we build and form community connections. And my journey to this work, actually like many people's journey to this work, very few people really kind of set out to study this. Most people discover it. And it's things that I love about working in in kind of the world of social infrastructure. But, But my journey really came from experiences that I had. I was, you know, working on questions and topics of urban design and of engineering and international development. And I had a chance to visit and and study in Copenhagen, where they have a lot of these kind of third spaces. And I started to notice that I could be in a space and I maybe could buy a coffee, but I didn't have to. Maybe could get a drink, but I didn't have to. I could meet a friend. I could listen to music. And it became this really freeing and welcoming space for me. And when I kind of returned back to the U.S., returned back to Boston, I started noticing that there is a real lack of truly accessible public third spaces. And, you know, whether that meant that there was a significant financial barrier to entry or that meant that, you know, we were kind of 
thinking about parks as our only third spaces, which if anyone you know listening it, it lives in the Northeast or any part of the U.S. where it's not beautiful weather year round, you'll know that you know parks aren't always going to be a place you can gather in the dead of the winter. And at the same time, though, started to notice that we had also tons of underutilized spaces. In, especially in, in a lot of our, in our urban areas, we are so constrained on space and yet you still see vacant storefronts. And so we kind of asked this question of what if we turned one of those vacant storefronts into a temporary public space? And because we know like, okay, if we want to build a new public space, that's going to take years. So we said, what if, in, you know, instead of kind of planning for a huge long-term project, we tried to open something up in a matter of months, not a matter of years. And so we, we really kind of took that charge. We tried it out. We did a month-long pop-up community space in a previously, you know, underutilized storefront area. And, you know, we kind of said, if no one likes it, if everyone says, you know, hey, I don't, what are you doing here? I don't need this, then great. We like did our work, we can pack up and go home. But then that's not what happened. People really connected. And the response that most most got me is that people would come by the space. Again, it was open for 30 days. We had over those 30 days, like over 50 events, everything from like a dog show to we were watching the World Cup together. And people would come in and they would say, I've been looking for a place like this. I just didn't know it could exist. And that's what really made us understand that we had hit on something interesting because people were craving these kinds of community spaces, but because they haven't had exposure to them, they actually didn't even know they were possible. And so we thought if we could actually create more of these spaces, and even if they're temporary, even if they're pop-ups, which again is a much quicker, cheaper way to do it, that we could start to get people to see and experience the value of them and that would in turn affect really long-term change. So that was almost seven years ago now. And we've been able to, to, to lucky to continue on this journey and do projects with many communities and have really expanded our work into now really helping communities to pilot these kinds of spaces to address needs that they're really seeing in their local community and then use that to also affect long-term change. So, Aaron, it seems to me that more than ever, people are craving connection. And I think a lot of that is due to being locked up for two years with COVID. People were very, there was a lot of folks who were afraid of coming out after that due to that. When we look at what has taken over what our third places are, they're they're chat rooms, right? We're all on the internet now and we're all meeting people that way. However, there's many facets to why that is problematic, but one just being that with this so-called culture war going on, regardless of that, the connections and networking that you're going to do on the internet isn't very deep. It's superficial. We even have looked at the science of, of just doing a Zoom like this doesn't reach all, everything that it needs to for the, us to be satisfied with that connection. And part of that is due to not being face-to-face in real life, we're unable to see the micro expressions that we mirror that allow us to connect. There's a lot of that going on. You mentioned that you had been doing this for seven years. Have Had you noticed a shift or difference before the pandemic and after the pandemic of how it was received and how people saw it? The answer is, like most things that the pandemic did, it exacerbated an existing issue. And so we we saw it before. I think we saw even more urgency, even more need for that. What we also saw to the pandemic is that a lot of the space we relied on as our third spaces were not actually able to sustain that function in the midst of, of COVID. And I think a lot of them have come back to that. The, the ex- kind of examples that I could give are, I really believe that we need a strong network of public spaces, of social infrastructure, of third spaces. And those will include businesses, those will include parks, those will include libraries, those will include places like culture house pop-ups. But the issue is that we have relied for a long time very heavily on commercial spaces to provide our third spaces. And there's a couple issues with that. One is, of course, 
while a lot of spaces are very, you know, don't, you can, don't have to buy something if you're there. A lot of spaces, some spaces now are, especially started in COVID, it's continuing now, are enforcing time limits. I've seen coffee shops that say you have a time limit for how long you can be here. So there can often be a real, like that financial barrier to entry. But also during when the pandemic really started, most businesses had, had to, because of their model, had to focus on making money. They had to focus on sales to make sure that they could be open. And so that meant removing a lot of the public access and focusing on, you know, I have a coffee shop near me that just like, they're like, we're just going to do a takeout window. Like we don't have the ability to actually manage even having outdoor seating. And so I think what it just did show is that we need to have this broad network because it makes us more resilient during a time of crisis to be able to still provide is a central service. And I want, I want to also just back up quickly and, and highlight a couple of things that you just mentioned because I think they're really important. I want to mention, you know, we think about why is it important to have these kinds of spaces. And there are two very interesting researchers that I want to bring into this that literally have shown that it is actually a matter of life and death. So there's a sociologist, Eric Kleinenberg, who did a bunch of research work around social infrastructure. He's actually one of those really popularized that term. He did a particular study where he looked at the 1990s Chicago heat wave. And he found that once you accounted for all other factors, race, socioeconomic status, everything else, communities that had fewer public spaces saw higher rates of mortality. And the reason was that they didn't know, people didn't know their neighbors because they didn't have a chance to meet them. And so when the heat wave hit, the communities with good infrastructure, you know, you knew that your neighbor down the block was older or didn't have an air conditioner and you helped them out. And so a lot of people that died during that crisis died alone in their apartments. And so there's research that shows that there was a similar effect with the pandemic, that communities with worse infrastructure saw worse outcomes from it because there was not those networks. There's another fantastic researcher named Robert Putnam who has done a lot of work on this. And recently they released a kind of documentary about a lot of his work called Join or Die. And it is actually really focusing on the decline of um, clubs and social organizations and traces a similar path to say that a lot of the division that we see is really a result of this declining membership. And you know, I think that there's a lot that comes from, but ultimately, I think we have to focus on what are the the reasons why it's still so important. You also you also are bringing up this kind of question and this notion of why it's so important to gather together and not just in digital spaces. And one of those is certainly about the having a proximity to your community, a physical proximity and the support that, that brings. Another piece you mentioned about facial expressions from the urban design world is a really fascinating study that actually shows that at about 40 to 45 feet away from someone, we stop being able to recognize their facial expressions. And so if you live on a really wide street, you're less likely to know your neighbors across the street. And if you live in a narrow street, you may not know their name, you may not know much about them, but you've maybe waved hello to them. And if you need something, whether it's like as simple as, you know, the proverbial cup of sugar, or it's something really serious, you're more likely to trust them. And so I think that really translates also into why it's so important to have those close connections to build social trust. Well, at the end of the day, we are herd animals. And in order to feel safe, we need to be within the herd. And part of that is familiarity. So if we don't have that, we're going to have anxiety. We're at a core level. We're not going to feel very safe. I'm curious, looking at this problem historically, so you mentioned a visit to Denmark and how it's different in Europe than it is here. What are some of the historical causes that are behind this decline in the U.S. in particular? Yeah, it's a good question. And there is a lot of kind of conjecture about exactly where it's coming from. I think we can draw a couple of threads. For the most part, people actually haven't found that living in a more digital world has has been the largest negative effect on this. That actually a lot of it is just that the way, uh, and there's a connection to that, of course, but it's maybe a little bit more indirect, that the way that we gather has changed. I mean, take, for instance, about even where we're living or the kind of the ways that we shop. If you're going to the, the store in your neighborhood to get, whether it's some groceries or it's to get a piece of paper, whatever it is, that you're spending time in your community. If everything's getting delivered to your door, 
that's removing a chance that you have to connect your community. And that, that kind of change in commerce pattern, while it's not, there's can be lots of advantages to that, it means that we need to reflect and say, how are we filling the gap that that once took? There is larger connections to the further division that we experienced. There, I think there's a, a kind of chicken and egg thing there, right? Like as a push and pull that more division has created as opportunities to meet others. And it kind of is a self-perpetuating cycle. And so I, I do think there's also an, an, an important need to, to actively work against that cycle. And we can eventually turn that into a positive feedback loop. But it, it takes a lot of intention and effort to make that actually successful. Yeah, I think about the rise of secularity and the decline of institutions. So religion being a third place for, for many people centuries ago and institutions. So you mentioned social clubs, gatherings. A lot of these institutions provided those spaces that weren't commercialized, that would allow you to spend time without having to make money off of that. And those are in decline. And, and then COVID really pushed them further into decline. And one thing that I've recognized about Europe and urban design is that they don't have suburbs like we have here that are just large, sprawling areas and massive superstores. It's happening. It's starting to happen in the cities I visited in Italy and uh, in Italy, in France, but it's not nearly as massive of a movement outside of cities and into suburban spaces like there is in the U.S., and, you know, if you're spending time in Paris, you're walking to the market, you're walking past your neighbors, you're in that proximity as an urban design specialist, you know, that creates that familiarity. Now we're in our cars, even if we aren't getting Amazon delivery, and that car then takes us to a massive superstore where we're spread out, we're maybe encountering one or two other people in an aisle on a trip, and then we head back home, and we really are devoid of those proximity places that create that urge or at least the need for small talk to engage the community and to feel connected. Yeah, there's no question about it. You know, suburbanization, reliance on on personal vehicles, and this disconnection from place is a huge factor. And I mean, that is why it is all connected here. But I mean, just as an example, like I, I mean, I live in an extraordinarily walkable neighborhood and I regularly, you know, I have a luckily very short walk to work, but I'm walking to work. If I'm walking to the grocery store, I would regularly see, you know, three, four, five people that I recognize. And there is really no substitute for the connections that you create during those, just those very informal moments. And it's nothing you have to plan for. Um, it makes it part of your daily life. So it, it is certainly very tied to land use, very tied to the, you know, the actions of the U.S. government to prioritize um, really, I mean, Every, of course, the suburbanization, but this also ties into the way that the U.S. government used redlining to physically segregate neighborhoods and push poor blacker communities out of certain neighborhoods and, you know, using building highways to those neighborhoods as well, that there has been a lot of active destruction of those places that we used to use to form community. One very interesting example, you mentioned also the way that religion and declining religion has also, and those used to kind of serve as a lot of those gathering spaces. Actually, in, in Denmark, there has also been a, a big decline in membership in religious organizations. And the government has actually taken a pretty deliberate effort to actually turn some of those old churches into now public community spaces uh, to serve a similar role, but kind of using a different format. It's interesting because I see a lot of polls and data pointing that people since COVID are coming back to the church, but what they're not coming back to is those institutions and the church itself. And, and again, it goes to show how this technology tends to separate us as well. The other thing that I'm seeing online is more misanthropic sort of tones coming from people. And when you're not around people in a third place, when you're not conscious of that, when you're not working with people, well, it's easy to be misanthropic. If you're just on the internet all day, all you're going to see is all the worst <laughs> parts of people. But when, you, let's say a disaster happens, such as the folks in, in Asheville, well, in order to fix that, the government was interfering with a lot of those folks. And the only way that they were able to get anything done and to move forward to clean this up was to get together as a community to do it themselves. 
And thinking about that, now I li- lived in North Carolina and I know the folks up there and it's a very, those are close knit communities, but to have a catastrophe happen to that degree in some of these more urban communities, that scares me because while the communities are incredibly segregated, people are not spending time together or there is no connection between you and your neighbor. So we're seeing the effects of all of that go in one direction and it's going to continue to move in that direction and get worse unless things are done. We can't wait for the government to go, oh, you know what? We have a loneliness crisis. We better start building some third places. Like that's not on the list. And it was a breath of fresh air when one of our clients had sent me the article that you were in. I was like, right on. So it's like, I want to get this guy on so other folks can hear what they can do about that as well. Let me provide a little a little bit of hope here, which is that I think we are finally seeing some movement towards identifying this as a need and also then giving it the funding and the focus that it deserves. And I will say that communities have always found places to gather. It is, I think, an inherent part of who we are is we gather. And so I really see a lot of the role of, of my job is to make that easier for people. Ultimately, a top-down approach to telling people how to gather is not going to be effective. What you have to do is to invest, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't force it. I always say that people never do what you want them to do. You design a space, they'll use it how they want to, not how you want them to. And so I really view it as, you know, in my role, I really view my job as creating a foundation creating the conditions that make it easy for people to gather and form those communities. And I I think that the kind of the kind of hope here is that we are starting to see it's a big task to do that. It takes resources, time and money. It happens at a very grassroots scale, but it's certainly made easier when when there is larger support for it. And, you know, in, in May of 2023, the Surgeon General did release a report declaring loneliness an epidemic. And that was a huge step in actually finally like naming what's been occurring for many years now. Also, what's been interesting is we have seen with the COVID response money, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the American Rescue Plan, that there has been a lot of funding into health. And in that, we actually saw finally that they're actually, when the, they put out the praise for that health, that they understood that investing in communities in creating a strong community and creating community gathering places actually had positive health outcomes. And it was one of the really the, the, the kind of first that I've seen on such a large scale, that identification within funding. And so we're actually now at this point, though, where a lot of that initial funding and that, that funding funded a lot of our work. I've seen so much work funded by the COVID response money that has gone to, to incredible community based places for gathering. And I think the challenge now is as that money starts to kind of reach the end of its cycle and we kind of move from a COVID recovery to going back to the way things were is we need to learn from that lesson. The fact that we identified that after a pandemic means that we need to be continue doing it because it will make us more resilient for future crises. So there's there's like a very big hope there that it happened, but I think also a call to say that we need to continue keeping us at the forefront of our minds. So I'd love to time travel a bit back to that first pop-up because one of the things that we chat about with our clients in hopes of finding a third place or creating one themselves by hosting their community members, neighbors, et cetera, is feeling really intimidated and overwhelmed at the idea of trying to pull something like this off. And, and you pulled off a successful pop-up. So as this was forming as an idea, what were your thoughts around organizing, setting up, and, and how did that process play out? It's a great question. And at times it wasn't easy, <laughs> but we did it step by step. So actually, one of the very first things that we did once we had this idea and we kind of thought this would be really interesting and cool, we, we wanted to talk to people. So we wanted to know, like, OK, were you just imagining this? Is this kind of in a couple of our brains or, um, you know, is this a larger thing that other people are also experiencing? And so we actually took a about, I want to say, 17 degree day in December. We went to Cambridge, Massachusetts. We brought a couch. We brought a rug, a coffee table, and some hot chocolate and a giant chalkboard. And we sat, we set it up in a park, in a public plaza. And we invited people to come sit down. And on the chalkboard, we just wrote, I wish I had a place too, and let people fill it in. 
And, you know, even though it was freezing out, like people came, they sat down, they talked with us, they talked to each other and they told us what they wanted. People and people said, I want a place to hang out without having to buy anything. I want a place to listen to music. I want a place to meet a friend. And so that was a small but significant step for us to say there's something here and it's worth pursuing. And, you know, we were able to get some, some, a little bit of funding to help us do our very first pop-up space. But, you know, we had, we had a space lined up and a week before opening, we found out it fell through. And so we scrambled, we found a new place, (laughs) you know, we had a lot of challenges there, but what we did is we consistently went back and we just talked to people. We sat in a park, we sat in in the public space that existed and we put up a board and we invited people to sit and talk with us. There's actually a really amazing group called Camarados. They're based out of the UK and they have a lot of, most of their focus in the UK, but they have chapters all over the world. And they essentially are working to promote what they call public living rooms. There's one in Boston, uh, this woman Gina runs one in Boston. It's, It's amazing. And they ask people to just like basically put out a couch and a sign that says this is the public living room and come sit down, have tea, talk. And it can, it can be really as simple as that. So I know I've, I've talked to people, I've talked to a, a woman who was in LA and was, you know, I don't, I don't, she's like, I don't have space to meet my community and how can I start something? And we talked together and, and we decided she's going to put a, a bench out on her sidewalk in front of her house and, and just like sit on the bench and see what happens and see if people come in and sit and talk to her. So for us, it was very much an iterative process and we didn't start right away. But I think the first step is just inviting people to gather with you in public. and. That first space that it actually, you initially had your pop-up in, how did that come about? How did you find it and and what was the logistics behind it? Yeah, so we're able to get a small grant from a forest foundation and they were interested in funding young people who were starting up kind of new nonprofit venture ideas. And they took a chance on us and gave us some small fund that allowed us to essentially open a space for a month. And we basically went around, we, we pitched the idea to, you know, we, we, we just different you know, property owners. We connected with a lot of Main Street's organizations. Uh, Main Street's organizations are, are often really, they have a really good finger on, on the pulse of, of their communities and know property owners and what space is available. And so we, we connected with them. And then we ended up finding uh, this kind of like new market that was opening, essentially. And they um, had an empty lobby space they weren't using. And so um, we were able to use it and we turned, you know, kind of this empty space and we built it out over the course of a week, just using like kind of wood and, you know, stuff we could find that was available for us. We had ping pong tables, we had a couch, we had a projector, we, we gave away free coffee and tea as well. And I just, you know, made it, made a space that felt like home. And we, we, you know, had a couple of people working on it. We kind of split up the shifts, did some, did some different staffing arrangements and were able to make it work. But they actually, one very interesting thing, we talk about kind of this iterative approach and how do we, how, how do we actually get there? You know, it, oftentimes, you know, you have to build slowly. It takes someone to, you know, kind of take a chance on you and to, you know, you essentially asking someone usually if you can take their space and kind of bring your idea to it. We... As part of looking for a space for our very first pop-up, we toured another another location, another storefront, and the the kind of it was this larger you know property management group that owned it, and the person was asking us, you know, like which moving company would you use? And we're like, what do you like? We are the moving company. Like I don't know what kind of operation you think this is. And they asked, okay, and, and um, so which service would we be using for for bathroom cleaning? And like like. What do you mean we can clean a bath? Like we can clean a bathroom. Like they just they didn't get it. It wasn't really within the realm of what they understood, and so that didn't work out obviously. And we found a new space. But what we did is we documented. We took photos and we we collected data. We had surveys. We tracked how many people came in during what times, and we put together a report at the end. And I was presenting that report, presenting that project to a group of people. And someone in the room came up to me and, and they said, we're actually working with this, we're working with this, this client. They want to activate some of their, you know, kind of vacant storefront space or their developer. Would it be interesting talking to them? Turns out it was the same developer we had toured about a year earlier. But now with all this data and photos and stories about the impact the space had, just that one with pop-up had, and we had another conversation with them. They got it now. Um, they're excited about it and ended up funding us to do a project in that same exact space about a year later. Amazing. And what was the most surprising part of that first pop-up and, and the data that you collected? 
I think that the one of the I'll say one of the events that really stuck out to me and, and and did surprise me is I will say first that in all this work, there are things that I initially find surprising. And then as soon as I think about it, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where it's it's so shocking. And when we do our work right, it seems obvious. But it's actually it's actually quite shocking. But then but then you look back and you're like, oh right, it, it totally tracks. So one of the events that really sticks in my mind that we ran at the pop up space was we hosted a, a screening of the World Cup final, and you know we expected you know a couple people to come if you didn't have a lot of place to watch it. There's so many places to watch the World Cup. You know, it's playing all the bars and why would you you know you'd want to be in that environment? We don't we don't you know we didn't have a we didn't have drinks. We we bought a couple of snacks, but it was ultimately pretty small. But the crowd that came to watch was incredible. The space was full, like you could not fit another person inside of it. And it was families, it was teenagers, it was young adults, it was older adults. It was people who lived in the community for their entire lives. It was people who are, who are recent immigrants. It was truly such an incredible cross-section of the community. And I realized that there just are not a lot of spaces where that really existed, where you could actually go and and see that many different people in the same space sharing a similar experience. And so it was totally unexpected. But looking back, it, it, it of course makes sense. Also, people want a place to be. They want a place to connect. And so that that really sticks out for me. That is utterly amazing. And and that's what the great thing about it is the organic expression that comes from those places and and for people to get together and to see what happens. And that's one thing that you're unable to do online because who knows what sort of forces were driving certain expression. Whereas if we could take an example of, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an artist, a musician, so I could think of CBGBs in the early, mid 70s. Here is a, a bar that an owner had opened up his name was Hilly, and he decided he was going to have country and bluegrass bands there, and basically the whole thing flopped. But it was an open space, and the and the Ramones were like, "Hey, can we put some music in here?" and and they didn't learn how to play; they barely wrote songs. However, that the expression that they had put in there invoked and inspired other young kids to bring in their punk rock bands. And you had this massive art explosion that came out of there because the space was there. It was available. And you had an organic art scene explode from that, and which is incredibly important because online we don't see the invisible hand. And it's, we know who we're speaking to when we're at the, the dive bar or the cafe. They're in front of us. And all we have to go on is the rapport that we have built and the networking that we've done and the value that we, we give out to the community. And those are going to be the mechanisms that allow us to connect and then to see what, what sparks from there. And looking at the the future, what are you most excited about project wise? And have you heard of other people starting similar movements around third places? There is a lot to really be hopeful for, which is what really really drives me in this work. One of the things that really that really like continues to drive me is seeing people respond to the work and you know having that that, that recognition of of wanting to do this. And we're seeing a really a growing movement. And you know from in very informal groups to more formal groups, I think there's a real recognition of this. I'm very excited. We, we for, you know, Culture House have for a while been doing these very kind of individual projects, you know, kind of one-offs, if you will, with different communities. And we're exploring now the ways that we can actually help to provide more training and almost more of a cohort model to be able to bring in other community groups that want to do this in their own community that we might not have always the capacity to do. And so we want to try and find more ways to just share our resources, share our learnings. Um, we learn so much from other organizations that are in the field. We want to do the same because we really believe that it takes a truly, you know, giant, a truly incomprehensible number of people to actually do this and it has to be done in every community. So that's something that we're working on right now. And we are also actually going to be operating 
our very first longer term space. We did a pop in a space and it's now since that pop up has identified the need for it and is uh, committed to, to kind of funding a long term public space there. And we're going to be kind of operating that um, starting next year. But there are I would say it's really a very much a growing area and Prince, no matter where you are, there will be a community group that is working on these things where you live. And I think it's there is a lot of great networks that are starting to evolve. There is Placemaking US. They focus kind of on the larger placemaking movement, but they've been starting to gather people together around these ideas and starting to form these coalitions. But it's certainly something that I only see continuing to grow. Yeah, I'm curious, how do the businesses support? What are the grants like and, and how do you put together those deals? Yeah, it's a good question. It's always a bit challenging, right? Like there is not enough funding for this kind of work, these kind of priorities. So we, I mean, we often, when we do our work, we typically, we always partner with a community organization and typically we work with them together to try to identify funding sources. And oftentimes it's a mixture of grant applications and it's occasionally donations, but, you know, sometimes it's, you know, able to get, you know, funding allocated through municipal budget, but it's a lot of piecing together. So something that we're always working on is trying to find more ways because to make that accessible, because ultimately we also know the communities that need these spaces the most have the least resources for them, you know, especially in black and brown communities and other BIPOC communities, you know, there is a real disinvestment in these public spaces. And there are also communities that are at least likely to have the resources to, to support them. And so we're always trying to find ways to be able to really message the importance and the impact of these projects to funders, which can be a challenge. You know, you're talking about fairly, sometimes fairly intangible impacts. And so a lot of work has focused on documenting and providing some of those metrics that can help us to make an effective case to someone that might be interested or might be willing to fund this kind of work. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how it goes considering the decline of commercial property and, and real estate being empty in, in most urban areas with us moving more to remote work environments and how we can reclaim some of those spaces in more creative ways to create community, to incentivize people to be more social and just to gather in general. There's a lot of opportunity, no question about it. Yeah, one of the stories I'd love to share around this concept at a much smaller level, I think when we hear of third place, we would love to find some place to go to, but sometimes it's just not available to us. And sometimes just opening up your home, even your front porch could be a way for neighbors to gather. And I'm always surprised by our clients' reticence in the beginning around, oh, what happens if I invite people and they say no, or they're too busy, or the assumptions that we all make around how other people have community and aren't craving community like we are. And how quickly just hosting a few people can turn into a full-fledged weekly event and something regular because everyone is craving this. And one of our clients, he was saying, hey, you know, I, I basically spend so much time with my family. I haven't been sharing as much time with neighbors. We used to hang out more and we hadn't been doing it in the past. And he simply told his neighbors that next week he was going to be hosting a little gathering on his front porch, not assuming too many people would come over. And, and almost half the neighborhood came to the first one. And it became a weekly thing. And they were excited. And then he realized, oh man, this is every week. So they started rotating porches. And all of a sudden it just brought the community together and the kids were playing. And, and it was just one of those moments where he was like, man, why didn't I think of this sooner? And why did I let those little insecurities or fears around people saying no, or I'm too busy or, or not showing up, hold me back from creating this opportunity that everyone was able to enjoy out of it? Yeah, that's amazing. And I'll, yeah, I think that's such a fantastic way to think about it. And oftentimes you're surprised at how many other people are sharing similar priorities to you, really. I'll give maybe two other also ideas that people can people can use of ways that they can start to, to build these things. So one would be to host a block party. Every city is a bit different, but I know especially where I live that cities have made it really easy to host block parties. Actually, in both Cambridge and Boston, they will give you a budget They'll give you money to host a block party. Not every city does that, but I've done it now. I've done three, hosted three block parties on my street. The very first time I hosted it, I put flyers on everyone's doors and someone, um, like my email to contact for questions. So an email and she said, I've lived in this street for 40 years and I don't know any of my neighbors. Thank you so much. And she came out and she met a bunch of neighbors in the block party and it was a blast. So host a block party. They're fun. It's such a great way to meet people and just to, you know, to put up a post in your neighborhood, let people come by. Another one is this, some of my, uh, actually my roommate has started doing, but he now hosts weekly office hours. 
So he goes to a bar every week and he says, like, I'll be here on Tuesdays, from, you know, eight to 10. Come by and, and, you know, like say hi or whatever it is. And, you know, maybe no one comes by and that's fine. And he can, he reads or whatever. He, you know, can just have some time for himself or someone comes by and he has a great conversation. Yeah, it starts really small, but it creates such a large ripple in your community and we're all craving it. So taking the lead and putting yourself out there first can really create a movement much like you have. And I'm so excited to hear more about where Culture House goes because I know a lot of our clients are craving third spaces from our conversations and working together. I love that idea of filling the cracks. And one of our clients, Malcolm, was trying to get people to go to a happy hour and was kind of struggling. And he loves trivia and he found himself playing trivia on his phone quite often. So he's like, what if I just invite people to a trivia night instead of a happy hour? And just having that one activity actually unlocked more people saying yes. And he found a bar that didn't really have a ton of people in the late afternoon, early evening. He used the same trivia app on his phone to host it, but he could do it with people downloading the app. And he started to fill the bar and the bar owner was so happy that they were actually getting clientele. And not everyone was buying drinks, but it definitely livened up that atmosphere and that environment around that one activity. And Johnny mentioned this earlier, parlor games, but I do feel like if you are gonna try to fill the crack, to add that activity, to add that reason for people to gather instead of just leaving it open-ended, creates that spark, whether it's watching a World Cup final, we used to host people in LA around NFL Sundays, recognizing that a lot of people in LA were transplants. So everyone had different teams and it allowed us all to gather and talk about the teams from where we're from. So having that activity tied to it, I, I think helped Malcolm in this situation. And then also, I think for you, you saw the same benefit in, in the pop-ups that you were running. So I really encourage those audience members to find that activity associate it with a place that doesn't have to necessarily be your home. It could be a public space or it could be a, a cafe or a bar that doesn't have high traffic. And you'd be surprised how quickly that can catch momentum. Well, another one of our clients to fill in the cracks, they were taking Cards Against Humanity, that silly game, and going to the patio of their bar every Sunday afternoon. And whoever was on that patio, they're like, hey, we're playing games, Cards Against Humanity. And so some people would join, some people wouldn't. But by the end of the, the evening or early evening, every time the patio was packed, everyone was yelling and screaming and laughing and carrying on. And it turned into a huge thing. And with Cards Against Humanity, I mean, there, it's, you don't need to understand how to play 500 bid in order to do that. It's a, it's a very easy game. And, you can play some and, and opt out, and, and, it, and it just makes it very easy for people to get engaged. Absolutely. There is actually one of the spaces that inspired Culture House to start in Copenhagen called Studenter Who's It. I was talking to the guy who runs it last year, and he called it a third interest. You have a third space, you also need a third interest. So, you know, what's that, what's that interest that connects you and someone else? And I love the way of framing it. That's beautiful. Where can our audience find out more about your work at Culture House and how can they support you? Absolutely. Yeah. So best way to find out is our website, culturehouse.cc. We're also at culturehouse.cc on all socials. Definitely encourage if you, you know, live in the Boston area, um, we are always posting about things that we're doing. But also, you know, we do a lot of sharing of our work more broadly and we like to talk to people across the country and across the world about it. So if you know what we're talking about resonates with you and your community, please reach out to us. We also have, we created what we call the Culture House Handbook. And it is a book that goes through the process that we take to create our pop-up spaces. And it's beautiful. It's got lots of photos and diagrams and it's available on our website to view for free or you can purchase, you know, digital downloads or physical copies. So also, you know, a great way of, if what we're saying resonates with you, just start to learn from it. And, you know, if we in any way can help you bring more third spaces to your community, you know, we'd love to help. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was great. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. 